don't know about you guys, but that music, I thought I, I was actually that. on that beach <laughs> somewhere it in is, the Bahamas. <laughs> it's like a meditation. It's great. <laughs> So thank you all for tuning in today and welcome to the latest Trailblazer webinar on alternative payment solutions for smart hoteliers. My name's Eloise Hansen. I'm the editor at Boutique Hotel News. We are a multimedia B2B platform for boutique, lifestyle and luxury hotels. One of our sponsors today is Bizon, and Bizon is a restaurant management platform which has recently just been acquired by Muse, and we have Richard here on the call today. But I'm going to hand over to Melanie Kempton to introduce Bizon. So over to you, Melanie. Thanks, Eloise. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, so, yeah, I'm a sales manager at Bizon, who have recently become part of the Muse family, which we're super excited about. Um, so we are an end-to-end -end restaurant management platform. We work globally, we work with brands such as Mercure, Ibis, Holiday Inn, as well as smaller groups and independent single site hotels. Um, as part of our solution, there are four main pieces. We have the mobile POS, which is truly cloud-based and accessible via any Android device. We have Bizon integrated payments, um, inventory and digital QR code ordering and that's kind of one of the main sort of solutions that, are, that everyone gets very excited about at the moment. Um, within that there are a number of channels that you can use to funnel your F&B revenue through. We've got click and collect, a room service which is quite a hot topic at the moment, um, as well as in the restaurant you've got options of allowing the guests to order and pay straight away and also order and open a tab. Within these, there is usually the option to charge across to room. So with our PMS partners, so for example, you could charge across into the room bill in Muse. Um, but also there's the option for the guests to pay themselves using um, Google Pay, Apple Pay, or typing in a long card number. Um, and I think that's really important because you're giving them the option to, <clears throat> to manage that payment process while still being able to let them split the bill and add tips. Um, and in a society that's going much more cashless, that's what guests want. And it obviously relieves the pressure on the front of house team as well. Um, so if you've got any questions, want to find out more, then please do drop me an email. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. So we've got uh, Melanie's uh, LinkedIn profile, um, her email address, we've actually got Bizon's LinkedIn profile into the chat there if you would like to hear further information. So a few webinar guidelines before we begin. We're going to spend around 45 minutes uh, discussing with our trailblazers today about alternative payment solutions. And if anybody in the audience has any questions today, please submit these using the Q&A function and I will get round to these as and when. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. And this webinar recording is going to be emailed to every registrant uh, within a couple of days after we have finished. A second sponsor for today's webinar is Elena. Uh, they are a property management software and we have a short video which we would like to play for you today. Further information about Elena has been uh, popped into the chat if you would like to hear more. 
Now, unfortunately, Anne-Marie is unable to join us today and she sends her sincere apologies, but I believe we do have her LinkedIn profile, so feel free to connect if you would like to follow up with her. But however, let's meet our trailblazers today. And what I'm going to do is move from left to right as per the PowerPoint screen, which means Rohit, I'm kicking off with yourself, please. Rohit, sorry, you're on, you're on mute at the moment. Hi, I'm Rohit Talwa. I'm a global futurist specialising in advising hospitality, travel, tourism and aviation, uh, particularly around payments innovation. And right now, uh, there's an awful lot of focus around things like crypto and the metaverse. So I'm trying to help demystify that for clients. Thank you, Rohit. And Richard, I'm handing over to yourself next, please. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm Richard Volta. I'm the founder of Muse, which is primarily a property management system. Um, we're used in over 75 uh, countries in, in more than 3,000 um, uh, 3, locations and uh, growing incredibly fast. And uh, it's great to be talking to you about one of my favourite, favourite topics. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. And David, coming to you next, please. Uh, yes, good afternoon. I'm David Cabreza. I work with Sander Pay. Uh, it's a, a relatively uh, new company in the payment space, uh, focused on B2B payments between OTAs and hotels, uh, essentially offering alternatives to virtual credit cards as, as a payment method. Thank you, David. And last but not least, Ludovica. Hello, nice to meet you all. I'm Ludovica Rocchi, brand director and part of the family owning the Art Collection Hotels. It's a 100% Italian family owned business with a strong vocation for excellence in hospitality. Just to give you a quick overview of the group, we have an important presence on Lake Como with five hotels, but also in Liguria by the seaside with a charming location with an amazing position overlooking the Tigolian Gulf. Um, and uh, furthermore, we are also with three uh, locations in uh, uh, Milan, so more business uh, properties. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we've got everyone's LinkedIn profiles there in the chat. So we encourage everyone listening today to connect and carry on the conversation. So before we get into our questions today. Um, I'm just going to run through some stories that we've published on Boutique Hotel News, which I think is relevant to our conversation. And I'd like to um, highlight Kessler Collection, as I believe they were the first luxury uh, US hotel group to partner with BitPay. BitPay is a BitPay, yeah, a provider of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency payments. Speaking at the time, Kessler's chief commercial officer um, explained the reason for um, making this move. And he said that it will make it easier for guests to pay in their local currency exchange and save money with a lower exchange rate. Also on BHN, we've covered uh, NFT launches, and we're going to be talking to Ludovica about this later. And we've recently published a feature on how to best manage chargebacks. Now on the next slide, these are headlines that have been taken from other media sources. And the top headline here explores how buy now, pay later options are being used in travel and hospitality. And this top article really kind of argues that this solution is being used to help get travel recovery off the ground in 2022. And we're seeing this method used a fair bit within airlines. One of the examples they give is a, a buy now pay later provider uplift which has signed two deals this year with southwest airlines and canada jetlines and that article also explores how these schemes are being used in in the vacation rental industry second headline i would like to uh, draw your attention to is the third one down in this list about hidden hotel and airline fees being under fire this tends to look at the impact of inflation on hotel pricing and additional fees. And Marriott has since said that it is instituting a new price transparency rule for travellers. And the company has recently mentioned in its fourth quarter earnings call that in 2022, the group expects, quote, continued growth from our non-RevPAR related fees 
driven by higher contributions from credit card fees. Now, this is all context, just background stories that should help with our conversation today. So let's talk about alternative payment solutions for smart hoteliers. And I would like to kick off with a question um, for David. And it's a real top line overview. What are the core components or, or the foundations for a strong payment strategy? Um, gladly. Well, I, I think any payment strategy needs to be scalable, flexible, uh, obviously secure, you know, very important to anyone, and global in nature. I, I think those are, are fairly given. I think where things are changing a bit more is uh, certainly on the hotel side, that payments are not just that thing that happens at the end of a booking anymore. Mm -hmm. They really are strategic. And, and so uh, I love that we're talking about payment strategy. I think that it really should drive a lot of the, the distribution strategies. You know, so looking mm -hmm. at where the guests are coming from, where they're going to, what type of payment methods are relevant to them, not just you know, what type of payments have we taken historically in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think a, a real focus on guests is very important and understanding you know, for any hotel, property, brand, to understand who their guests are and, and what is important to them. Um, I think also a central, centralized strategy is, is very important, and particularly for the, the larger hotel groups, but also for the ones which are you know, more regional in nature, perhaps, uh, in that historically the hotel industry has been very was well, not only fragmented, but even within chains, you've got different ownership groups and the difference between the brands and the property owners does cause a, a lot of issues. So it's really looking at it from a broad and holistic perspective and trying to centralize as much of that as possible. Uh, a couple of other things I'll, I'll just touch on very quickly as an introduction to that, but I think we look at consumer-based payments, but we also need to focus on the B2B payments. Uh, which are often overlooked. You know, we think, oh, Apple Pay and WeChat Pay and the exciting things, but there's also a lot of potential on the payments that are happening between companies. Um, and then finally, I would say a, a strategy really needs to lean on the right payment partners. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are so many things happening in the industry and so many changes. Keeping up with technology, keeping up with the regulatory environment, all of that is too much for any one uh, hotelier or hotel brand. Uh, so I think really ensuring that you've got the right payment partners uh, for the coverage that you need, for the type of products that you need, and for the knowledge that you need is really important. So mm -hmm. as a high level, I think those are some of the, the key components. I'd love to hear from the others as well on what, what they think are relevant. Mm, yeah, please. Um, I'm going to open this up to our speakers today. Um, if, if you have any other views or would like to add as to what you believe is a sound strategy moving forwards. Yeah, I, maybe I, I can just mm -hmm. jump in. I, <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, we've definitely seen an explosion of uh, different types of payment methods. Basically, I think that, you know, there are more and more kind of payment providers. I think that when we look at, um, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a neo bank, whether it's a payment type, uh, like for example, buy now, pay later, um, and whether that's associated with uh, somebody specific that that a that a consumer might like, for example, like like a Klarna, and mm. uh, kind of seeing their their rise. You know, I think that um, it's a lot more of a kind of fragmented uh, ecosystem than uh, than it was just a couple of years ago, and I think it's more about you know, also kind of understanding the fact that the payments isn't something that uh, happens, you know, with just by having a terminal, basically, and, you know, incorporating that terminal as part of a, a check-in process, basically, but actually seeing it as much more integrated into a, um, into your kind of revenue strategy as a whole, understanding that actually payments is something that you can then kind of extrapolate across that entire kind of customer journey. Um, and then also kind of seeing, you know, how maybe some of those different um, types of providers also kind of play in differently to a payment strategy that you might have. There might be something that you might want to try with a buy now, pay later type of client that you wouldn't want to try, for example, with a, let's say, a, um, uh, 
you know, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, data wallet or basically some kind of, you know, Bitcoin or, um, or Ethereum provider. Uh, but you might want to try basically something completely different uh, for, for a different type of um, uh, different type of user. And I think that, that that then also kind of, you know, with so much of that fragmentation, I come, uh, I think comes also a realization that, um, it's got to be associated also with your segmentation strategy, you know, mm -hmm. understanding who that person is and why they've chosen that payment type mm -hmm. and what next steps basically, or what, what other things are you going to actually kind of do, um, based on that information that, that, that provider actually kind of gives you. So I think it's, it's a much more holistic, um, uh, debate than just basically kind of talking about, you know, just, just a moment of payment as you basically have. Uh, on a terminal. Mm -hmm. I could offer a few thoughts there as well. Please. I, I think there's a fascinating challenge now for boutique ho hotel operators. On the one side, you've got the people coming to stay at your hotel where they have three choices. They pay beforehand, they pay while they're there, they pay afterwards, very simple. And then behind them, there is, as the others, have, uh, you know, David and Richard have suggested, there's a growing, almost exponentially growing complexity of providers, of technologies, of solutions. And when we bring it back to the hotels, particularly boutique hotels, independent hotels, or small chains, you've maybe got two people dealing with this. Uh, your revenue manager, your finance manager, or whoever, for whom there's relatively low levels of digital literacy generally. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more and more complex digital technologies coming through. And what I think is gonna happen, or has to happen, is that certain players will rise to the forefront who can mm. make this all very simple, very transparent, a set of choices that they make clear and behind the scenes, they manage it all. And we know that Visa, PayPal, MasterCard are all competing for that space. Uh, and some of the technology providers, unfortunately Amadeus can't be with us, but everyone is, is, is trying to compete for that space of clarity and saying, we'll manage all the back ends for you. And in a sense, the hoteliers don't really care if you're the best. It's whether you're clearest in explaining to us what the solutions you're offering provide or that you're aggregating provide. And most importantly, how much of my money will you take away? So of the 200 euros I take in a hotel payment, or I think I'm taking, how much of that will go to you? And, and I think that's the challenge, and I understand why all the individual players in the system are focused on their technology and their proposition, but it's whoever gets to providing that real clarity that I think will be the winner. Mm -hmm. Rohit, whilst you're, uh, whilst we're with you, are you able to please share a sort of top line summary of, of what's been happening in the market um, recently and maybe explain why and how companies even individuals are looking to embrace cryptocurrencies as, a, as an example of a payment method. Well, so everyone is looking for new revenue streams, but also trying to say, well, how do we protect ourselves against the kind of events we've just seen for two years with the pandemic and now the uncertainty we're seeing over what's going on in Ukraine and how that might spread. Mm. So everyone is looking for some degree of certainty and that's led some players to say, well, actually, is crypto one of the solutions? We know that if someone arrived in your hotel in London and said, I want to pay in euros, I want to pay in Saudi reals, we'd have no problem. We'd say, absolutely, we'll take the money and we'll convert it back to sterling. And we wouldn't even question that. We, we're set up to take those things. Now there's a growing segment of people who want to pay in crypto, whether it's because they've amassed some or because they're earning in crypto and they want to use that crypto to pay. Mm -hmm. So at the simplest level, we're seeing a lot of hotels like the Dolder Grand in Switzerland saying, yeah, let's take that money and we'll either convert it or we'll hold a proportion of it on the balance sheet in the hope that we get capital appreciation. That's now being made a lot easier by the likes of Visa and MasterCard. Mm -hmm. who are saying that a growing number of merchants, I think it's all merchants in the US for MasterCard and all banks can now issue crypto, can accept crypto and hold it on your behalf. So it, again, it just becomes another currency in, with which to accept payment. And why wouldn't you accept those segments? I think there's a, again, there's crypto is one of those worlds where there's a huge amount of noise 
a lot of incredibly bright technologists, economists and mathematicians creating these incredible propositions. But again, it's all about simplicity. It's about, well, OK, how does that help me as a hotelier? And we've seen people like Expedia and others now partnering with underlying tech providers to accept more and more cryptocurrencies. And I think we'll just see it grow because mm -hmm. there's no reason not to. There are something like 350 million crypto users in the world today that could double this year if current rates you know, continue. And it, it makes sense to say, let me target, let me accept money from, from whoever wants to pay in whatever means they want to pay. Mm -hmm. As you've just given an example of Expedia there, Rohit, um, we've had a question come through um, and I'll open it up to the panel as well about how, how do we see booking.com payments impacting the industry? I know I was speaking to someone about this the other day and I can't remember who it was on this. I think it was probably, David. <laughs> it could have been multiple people, but I, I, I know I certainly had my, my views on it. I think... Um, it is interesting in what, what booking is doing in terms of trying to eliminate a lot of that complexity uh, where you have a guest from one country. Uh, I think the, the example they've used is one that we've heard in the past of a guest from China traveling to somewhere in Europe, wanting to pay with WeChat Pay or Alipay or a you know, payment method relevant to them and the property not being able to accept that. And so with booking sitting in the middle, they take these payments, they convert them to virtual cards and pass them on. Um, and I think it, it's a really important thing for the for the industry to embrace and to understand that, you know, that there is some complexity there that we know we've been dealing with for decades. Uh, it's become much more relevant in the last two decades or so as we've had a lot of international travel and new payment methods. But um, this is something that you know I, I feel quite strongly about that hotel companies should be doing and they should be managing that they should be looking at their their customers and where they're coming from and building that into their strategy and looking at their payment methods and not relying on other companies to do that for them and by other companies i mean other companies in the <laughs> in the distribution space you know I, I know that they cannot do that on their own without a payment company but it feels like that to me is something that uh has been an opportunity and I think clearly Booking has seen that opportunity, as have some other partners too. And uh, they are taking advantage of that. And I, I think it is, you know, all, all advancements like this helps the customer. Uh, we just need to make sure that we are, as an industry, and you know, for the hoteliers in particular, looking at how they work that to their advantage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rohit, please. Yeah, if I could just add to that, sort of building on the point uh, that we just heard, it seems inevitable that we're going to accept a growing range of assets as payment. I think Richard's going to talk about data, but generally, uh, why can't I use my silverware collection to pay for a hotel stay? Why can't I use my collection of vintage hats? Or, you know, I have a choice now. With my Chelsea program collection, I can use either use it to buy Chelsea now that it's up for sale, or I can, <laughs> I can block book a bunch of hotels. Why can't I trade those things? I can sell them in other places. So again, who is gonna be that provider or that set of providers that start to say, we'll take anything and we'll trade it. We'll instantly work out with machine learning, we can work out you know, who offers the best price for whatever it is you're selling, we'll sort out the trade, and then we'll accept that as cash. And I think as we move into more uncertain times, as maybe we start to see pressure on people's incomes as automation mm. takes over, we need to start thinking in much broader ways about how people might want to pay. And at some point, for example, I might say, I'm going to tokenize my house. I'm going to turn my hundred thousand pound house into 10 million 1P tokens. And I might want to pay with a tiny proportion of my house every time I book a flight or a hotel. Right now, people will laugh at that idea, but there are already banks and building societies that are starting to tokenize properties to sell. So, so we can see this coming. And again, it's who the players are in the middle that get this, that can simplify the whole thing. And at the end of the day, just hand cash over to a hotel because mm -hmm. the hotel doesn't want to be doing the valuation of my programs. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Fascinating. And I'd, I'd like to um, bring Ludovica into the conversation here because you're doing something quite interesting with NFTs. And it was a really, for me, a different take on launching an NFT in, in that, uh, well, I'll let, I'll let you explain how it, how it works, but let's begin with what actually prompted the decision to create an NFT in the first place. And then how do you see this disrupting the hotel sector? So um, in 2022, we have decided to create an NFT in the metaverse as uh, we wanted to experience and try something new also in the speciality business. As you all said, the world is growing very fast, especially in the travel industry. So we really felt uh, the need uh, to expand our portfolio of activities, experiences uh, uh, in another reality, let's say. So we created, um, we created, um, a selling point of, our, of one of our property in the OpenSea flat platform. Of course, as we are a quite small, medium reality of group, we decided to get the help from a, um, a company that was having, of course, opening for us the OpenSea platform, having the wallet, having the crypto validities, and doing all the technological part for us. So, uh, we wanted to start selling something in the metaverse, but make also the guest experience what we were selling. Because at the end of the day, we sell rooms, we sell an experience, we want people to come and visit our properties and place and local areas. So uh, from my point of view, I really wanted that people could buy the stay in the metaverse world through an NFT, but also that they would have come and experience all what we can, what we could give to them. Um, since the 31st of January, we are online with a package that is a non-refundable package with a special price. Uh, we have received several um, interests about, at the moment we haven't sold it yet. The good things about uh, uh, having a stay in the NFT is also that it's a non-refundable one, but in case the people, the person who will buy this stay can also resell it in the mm -hmm. metaverse. So in case uh, someone will buy at the end, will, will not be able to join us, uh, he will resell it to whoever he likes at the price he likes. He can do a bit what he wants about it. So <laughs> definitely in five years time, maybe even less, I think uh, in the hospitality industry, this will be something more common. And from my point of view, probably we will also need to have a proper department as what we were saying before, dedicated to payments. Uh, dedicated to crypto values and uh, all this um, world because it's growing very fast. This was a trial from uh, for our group. We have also decided to launch very soon. We will launch uh, another stay, uh, a buyout of our hotel. So something slightly, uh, let's say, bigger compared to a two night stay. Uh, so I think uh, the world is going towards that direction. So we, we want to try and uh, after two years of COVID, uh, we said, why not? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. I think when we first um, spoke about the move, Ludovica, you nodded to the fact that it almost cuts out the OTA in a way as, as that middle man, because open the open seas platform and then tachyon which is managing that nft is essentially become wouldn't say the ota in itself but there's been this sort of tug of war in the industry for some time now about how can especially independent smaller hotels reduce their reliance on on otas with all the yes. emissions and the fees that are tied in with that relationship it's definitely a uh, booking 3.0, let's say. So definitely like before there was a uh, tour operator, travel agency, now they're going, uh, they're let's say lowering now. 
Now we have the OTA, which are a very a big, big part of our business. I have to say, Booking.com in first, but Expedia as well, many others. But at the same time, their commission is quite high, especially for independent hotels. In the metaverse, at the moment, let's say at the moment, there is no commission. <laughs> for uh, especially not that high, let's say, not even that high. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, in some way, this new way of booking, uh, maybe in two, three, five years time, it will definitely make the OTAs lower their, their expectation, their commission and uh, their priority, let's say. Today, you cannot, people say that you cannot live without Booking.com mm -hmm. because the main business comes from them. But who knows in two years' time, maybe there will be someone else uh, stronger. Mm -hmm. Rohit, I saw your hand <coughs> go up slightly. And... <laughs> I, I love what you're doing, Ludovica. I just got a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, when people buy, did you say they get a discount on the normal rate? And secondly, do you have to fix the dates when you make the purchase? Do you fix the dates you'll stay? So the dates are not fixed. So it's a two night stay in a um, suite with a dinner included and a two, a two hours massage for the couple. The dates are not fixed, so once the guests will buy the package, we will fix within the dates. Um, so, so at the moment it's free, so people can choose when to come, depends on our uh, availability. Uh, on the, uh, the other question, uh, the, um, can you repeat the first question? Is, is the price lower than the normal rate? For bookings so as a first trial we wanted to have a slight discount so from the bar the best available rate we discounted of five percent mm -hmm. so something very little i have to say so i was going to say would you would you stop it if an ota said i want to buy a hundred of these packages and then resell them because i guess <laughs> you could start to arbitrage the commission that's a good question. Mm -hmm. At the moment, the, this question hasn't arrived from them, so I'm not sure. Yeah. But maybe it could happen as well. Who knows? Okay. Do you like, see I... that as a real, realistic opportunity then from the OTA point of view? Uh, Richard, mm. we'll hand over to yourself here. No, like... <clears throat> I think that, you know, I, I love actually, A, the fact that Ludovica, that you're trying it. And uh, the second is that, you know, I think that I wouldn't want us basically or any hotelier in, um, who's listening to this to kind of start thinking about, um, you know, because I think the best way to look at, for example, cryptocurrencies in, them, in and of themselves, basically, is to look at them as communities. Don't think of them as payment types, basically. They're just, the, the payment type is basically an addition to it, but the fundamental aspect of it is that it's a community. You know, it's in the same way that, for example, booking.com is able to attract a very, very large community because of their ad spend on, um, on uh, and, and their kind of prowess with, uh, with Google. So if you think about them basically kind of arbitraging the community that, that goes and searches on Google, um, then being able to actually kind of direct that in the direction of a specific hotel. And I feel that, you know, right now, the best way to look at it is, you know, for those hoteliers who remember maybe, you know, 15, 20 years ago of just starting out on Expedia and booking.com, there were very, it was a very com committed community of users that wanted to go through there rather than going through Travel Cook. Um, and this is just the same thing that's basically kind of happening there. There's, you know, there's a community of users that are on OpenSea that are looking for different various kind of NFTs as, as kind of, you know, um, artistic objects or whatever they might be. And here they come again, you know, come across a, a, a real world uh, experience that they might actually kind of have. 
And so that community might actually kind of, you know, want to partake in that. Now, you've got to ask yourself basically always the question of, you know, is this the right product for specifically that community? You know, is somebody who's on OpenSea looking for those NFTs, are they the right, you know, is this a package basically that's that's right there? Or is it basically something that, I'm just, you know, presenting on all of these different kind of channels and I've just packaged it basically in exactly the same way that I would everywhere else rather than adapting it to specifically that community. Um, so I think that that really, really actually kind of plays a, a, a massive role. And I think that this is the way that um, people should be really thinking about, uh, especially kind of cryptocurrencies is that, you know, who's the community? And how am I actually kind of speaking to them in that way? I do think the second part, basically, though, uh, which, again, Ludovica uh, touched upon, I think it's something that, um, you know, that I think is a is a fantastic um, kind of next uh, next evolution of this, which is to say that, you know, if you think about your um you know the the kind of the the perishable good of a room being sold on a specific day and that kind of you know the 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 buyout of whether it's the hotel or basically a specific um uh specific room on a specific date that then basically becomes its own tradable commodity and if you think about you know the the potential of basically kind of getting your distribution in that way rather than basically kind of waiting for um you know uh, somebody to essentially kind of book something online i think that also kind of enables hoteliers to start thinking about you know the way that they think about their revenue management in a slightly kind of different way you could basically you know you you already kind of do it the same way you go you know i'm going to start out with my prices here and then once i get to 50 percent occupancy basically for that day i'm going to start shifting upwards so I think in the same way you can basically think about, you know, well, why don't I mint 50 NFTs uh, or 50% of my rooms basically as NFTs or as, you know, a, um, a specific um, uh, token and have them freely tradable. So essentially somebody will basically kind of take it at a specific price um, and then and then think about basically like how are you actually then going to be kind of filling the other 50%. All of this is extremely complicated. I do realize that it basically opens up a huge number of different questions for, for possibly like different different webinars. But I do think that the main aspect of this is the allowing yourself to kind of have some of these experiments, try some of these things out. Basically, don't also don't kind of release it as a, as a one off thing, you know, but but actually start iterating on it. Basically, you know, so if you did it as as this one thing why not basically try, you know, different iterations for all of these different kind of communities? Um, and then in that way, I think that, you know, it will give you a real first mover advantage if you're able to actually kind of um, uh, do this in the same way that, you know, the, the properties that were able to get themselves onto booking.com and Expedia, you know, very, very quickly and kind of figure out how to kind of get to number one those were the ones that basically really, really got a, um, a real lift um, uh, for, the, for the first couple of years. Yeah, and probably, it was, as you said, 10, 15 years ago was the same, probably even more, 20 years ago for booking Expedia, there was the same, let's say, fear or unknown and uncertainty about it. So I totally agree on what you're saying. Whilst we're back back to the, to the OTAs, I'd like to ask David what what are the challenges of, of managing, if you like, indirect sales that maybe come through the the online travel agents. It's a, a very good question. I, I think it's one that people haven't focused on a whole lot in the hotel industry, like I was saying earlier. Uh, but I think looking at the B two B payments, um, there are several challenges. Uh, obviously, there's numerous different partners out there that hotels, you know, either chains or independent properties can use definitely differing levels of knowledge uh, and there's also some um imbalance if you will in, in the knowledge uh particularly within payments at the hotel level and to some extent that can be used against hotels um one of the areas that we're focusing on is looking at uh the use of virtual credit cards and is that always the most 
efficient and effective and cost efficient way of transferring money between businesses. I mean, I would argue that that's not always going to be the case. When we look at literally billions of dollars being paid from businesses to businesses by credit cards, in some cases it makes sense, but in, in many it doesn't. And, and I think the um, the increasing number of positions that we're seeing now uh, within hotels and hotel companies in payments is, re is really reflecting that need and the desire for more knowledge uh, within the hoteliers about what are the opportunities and challenges uh, in, in payments. So I think part of that is then really thinking about for the hotels to think what's sufficient versus cost effective. And you know, certainly using the credit card rails to, uh, to enable payments is easy, uh, but it's not always gonna be the most cost effective, um, particularly when there are inbuilt incentives for some of the hotel partners out there to be using them because they're getting kickbacks and, and, the, and sharing the, the revenue that's going through that. So I think trying to level that playing field uh, by enabling other payment methods, by enabling other partners to maybe offer a more supplier-friendly approach to some of the, the, the larger players, you know, just kind of le leveling that playing field amongst the OTAs and partners. Uh, and I think the other thing I would just add to that is taking advantage of where we are now in the industry. And I, I know it's not a great time at all, uh, but business will come back. And it seems like now is the time to really be building for that and, and to be preparing that and thinking about uh, payments as part of the roadmaps uh, as hotel companies are planning the next, you know, two, five, 10 years. So, so what advice or, or what steps do you think can be taken now to prevent any additional fees or those kickbacks on payments <clears throat> in the future? I, well, I think there's two things. One is to first be aware of them, right? Yeah. It's hard to negotiate with partners if you don't have full knowledge and if you don't understand the, um, the financial incentives the partners have to using certain payment methods because there are rebates or kickbacks, then um, that is obviously going to work against you. I think the, the other thing though is really um, looking at the relationships that you have as a hotel and determining which ones does it make sense to use, uh, maybe less cost-effective ways, but really easy ways, like the virtual cards. And there'll be other cases where you'll say, that's not what I want for this type of relationship with a known or trusted partner that I've got different volumes with. So it, it's really, again, kind of coming back to what I was saying on the B2B, uh, on the consumer-based side, is understanding your, your partners, understanding your market and segmenting and deciding what is the right payment method for each. Mm -hmm. So speaking of payment methods, I would like to touch on a sort of buy now, pay later approach. I kind of referred to it earlier in my context and I'd, I'd like to ask um, Richard, how, what are the benefits and the challenges of actually implementing a buy now, pay later method with, within your, you know, say you're a, a, an independent hotel or a hotel, smaller hotel group? Please fire away your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, like <clears throat> for me, I think buy now, pay later. I think the best way to kind of understand it is a very, very easy way for somebody to gain credit uh, to come and actually kind of stay at your property. So I think that they... A lot of the buy now, pay later um, schemes, essentially, are now, you know, <clears throat> I think that the process for a specific person, basically, to get a credit card, um, you know, and to commit to also getting a credit card is, is quite a kind of, it's an arduous process, basically. If you see, for example, the split of millennials that have credit cards, for example, it's very, very low because... They, you know, I would actually say that it uh, that it's probably down to increased financial literacy. Um, that uh, a lot of the the younger generations, especially, kind of understand just how much basically you you can pay uh, to your credit card companies, basically just by you know the the, um, the fact of of using a credit card. So I think from from that perspective, it's an innovation on the idea of how to provide credit. And the likes of Klarna have, have kind of exploited that, I think, very, very well um, to create essentially what is a, 
an innovative way of looking at kind of credit card schemes, basically. And I think that more and more, you know, and it doesn't really matter if they're called Afterpay or um, uh, any of these uh, other types, it's essentially the same kind of um, uh, the same kind of process. And and again, basically to uh, to that, it, it then becomes the same as accepting Visa or, or MasterCard. You know, it's just a different type of scheme that's actually kind of, you know, helping the customer in that way gain uh, gain access to credit. I think it's also great for the uh, for the hotel from that perspective because I think that you know one of the things that we as hoteliers I think have um, uh, have done in the past, and I think that you know it, it's the point about, for example, the NFTs or anything like that. We're selling perishable goods. Um, in terms of, you know, if we sell this one room on this particular day, then that's, you know, going to be kind of terrible if they if they cancel. And what we basically kind of gave in at the very beginning to travel agents and, and any of these other different types of, you know, community providers was the idea that that actually they could cancel it at some point, which, you know, is, a, is an inherent risk to a, uh, to a hotelier. So I think that this is actually a, a great way of, of looking at um, some of these things where, you know, if somebody commits to, um, to you know, coming or to basically kind of using a, uh, a product like Buy Now, Pay Later, um, I think that that's also the, the way to look at it for, for a hotelier is that actually your, um, that, that person or that particular kind of uh, company maybe it's not going to be kind of on the same day maybe you want to give them you know some um uh some leeway there but it but it's actually a great way of of knowing that that is guaranteed income guaranteed revenue that you are actually kind of taking on um from from that perspective so i think that if you look at it from the perspective of moving away from fully flexible as mm -hmm. you know the the dominant um uh you know uh, rate met, like uh, rate type that you have in the hotel to actually ones that are basically kind of non-refundable and kind of locked in um with you know the flexibility that i think people kind of now expect in terms of you know i will i will give you the money but i might not commit to exactly that date basically within certain conditions mm -hmm. i think from that perspective basically i think that that's that's a great way to kind of look at uh, a scheme like buy now pay later it's 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 a different type of credit card uh, arrangement. I think it's one basically kind of, you know, works with consumers a hell of a lot more. Um, and I think, again, it's something basically that that most hoteliers have to actually kind of reckon with. I think just, just to kind of add to that as well, you know, one of the, the overriding uh, themes of, of all of these debates basically is that, you know, despite the regulations that have come in, despite all of these different things that are that are on the horizon, I don't think that there should be any hotelier who should think that the cost of payments will be going down anytime soon. Um, because if you look at, you know, what booking.com is doing with its, um, uh, with its payment methods and all of these things, yes, acceptance for the consumer, that's one thing, but the way that they're surfacing it up basically is that either you get, you know, very wide terms of basically that you only kind of get your money um uh you know in 45 days or so or if you want it sooner you know you're going to have to take their kind of virtual credit card which essentially means that you're going to pay more than two percent overall fees of, of probably around three percent basically for that transaction if you want to actually kind of get your get your money sooner so i think that that's a trend that you will see basically kind of everywhere and i think that the that actually with cryptocurrency with all of these different things i think it's actually better for the hotelier to assume that the average costs are going to be between two and a half and three percent um going forward there are ways of, of arbitraging that down but i think it's actually a um uh it's a, a different type of reality and it doesn't really matter if you're going to be paying those types of fees to OpenSea, to klarna to um to booking.com it doesn't really kind of matter because they're closing in on their communities. They're trying to basically kind of make sure that they're they're kind of trapping them in this in this way, and they will be surfacing that up to you basically in the form of higher uh, of higher fees. Um, and I think that that's that's a 
an unfortunate reality of where payments basically are. And I think it's more about the strategy of if you do have increased costs, basically, are there also increased revenue opportunities that you should be actually kind of um, attaching to to those increased costs as well? Mm -hmm. Rohit? So a few people have made the point in the chat that um, that going with this is, is increased cost and complexity at the back end for the hotel in terms of dealing with this. Uh, and setting up the systems to do it. The other thing is about who owns the credit risk. Uh, if I'm a big credit card company, I'm happy to write off credit defaulters with less than a thousand dollars in their account. But as, a, as an independent hotel or a small chain of, of hotels, how much are we willing to write off? And do we want to develop the reputation of being someone that you can stay with and then not pay? Uh, and then it's starting to think about, well, okay, do I then partner with one of the new credit card providers like crypto.com and agree that we'll share the, the interest payments for late payments with them. None of this, I think, is, is a, an instant winner. And we don't yet know with buy now, pay later what the default rates are because it's quite early in its adoption. Mm. So I, I think it's a very sexy proposition, like reinventing credit cards. But I think you have to dig a bit deeper to say, is it worth it for my hotel to go down this route or is it simpler and cheaper to just, just keep accepting credit cards uh, because that's easier for the customer as well. And there's a, there's a significant enough segment of customers who are happy to do this. Where I think that there is an opening is to, to increasingly make it easier to, for people to pay with direct debit, with their bank transfers, that kind of thing. I think that's all a possibility and I would go the other way and say so rather than getting into the whole buy now pay later can we get the pay pay in advance model where you used to have savings schemes where you could just put money in every month to pay for the hotel you stay you're going to have in a year's time I think that might also be a, an effective way of, of bringing money in and actually reducing the credit risk because if someone doesn't pay then they don't stay but you're getting the money much earlier so you can earn the interest on it as a hotelier. So I think that there are lots of options here. Buy now, pay later is one, but we mustn't forget the cost and complexity that comes with it for the back end of the hotel. Mm -hmm. We have a, a question here, which I might um, ping over to, to David around um, efficiencies and, and the cost of using credit cards, virtual credit cards, payment schemes. You know, how can hotels combat the fees and other forms of commission? I'm, I'm happy to talk to that. And, and I, I, although I agree very much with the comments just made, I feel a little bit more optimistic. I, I, I think that, that uh, there is the opportunity for more efficient payments, I think, particularly on the B2B side, uh, without doubt. Um, I think as more and more payment methods become uh, used, within the hotel industry as well, then the uh, the chokeholds perhaps that, that, that there is currently on the couple of payment methods that are out there and the, the fees have got to reflect that to, to some extent. Of course, complexity goes up without doubt. But again, that's why there are, I think, you know, a number of payment partners in, in that middle space who are willing and interested in making that go away. Yeah, at, le at least for, for, the, for the hotels, for the individual property owners. Um, and I think as we're dealing increasingly on a global scale, that, that's got to be um, where we end up. I think, um, you know, one of the things we were talking about earlier was the was kind of centralized payment strategies. And everything that we're talking about now, I think when it is done more centrally, has so much benefit for the properties. And this is where I think the boutiques are really well positioned. You know, they are very customer focused. They're generally more creative than the large global brands. They're willing to try new things. They are quicker to move. Um, and also I think just, you know, sometimes not dealing with quite the, the, the geographic spread makes it easier to, to do things. And I think when, once you start centralizing payments, particularly a strategy, you can then focus on your customers and you can think about how you are going to change the way that you interact with your customers. And there's so many benefits. I mean, just so, so many benefits. And I, I agree it's complex, but if you look at enabling that, you then improve the customer experience. You have access potentially to new revenue streams if you're going to do multi-currency pricing. Um, you're enabling, you know, 
uh, working with underrepresented market segments or those who might not have credit cards. Um, it hopefully increase conversion, improvements in cash flow, particularly if, as Rohit was saying, if we're moving towards prepaid. Um, potential channel shifts, you know, from some of the OTAs to more direct, which of course has huge savings on the commission side, um, mm -hmm. as well as you know, lower cost payment methods. So I, I, I think there is plenty of opportunity out there. I think there's plenty of reason to be doing it. Is it easy? No. And, and that's why the industry is, you know, really lagged behind. Uh, and the industry is a complex one. But I would just reiterate one of my closing points that there are companies out there that are, you know, that are better positioned to, to help with that. And so I think the future is 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 positive. Thanks. Thanks, David. I'd like to um, finish off with a, a couple of questions to Ludovica, just so that I can make sure that I'm pleasing our audience. Um, a couple. I'll, I'll combine them together, Ludovica. Um, what partner did you use to help with the payment systems on, on the NFT? And, and can you just explain how you access your our collection hotels using using the NFT? So we used a company, it's a startup company that was born end of last year, beginning of this year. It's called Tachyon. I will send the, maybe I will share also the link where you can buy the stay. So who knows? <laughs> Maybe it's a good, it's a good moment. And um, um, so we, as I said before, we've decided to go with someone that was more expert, especially technical wise, uh, into the um, NFT and metaverse world. Um, I think uh, there will be, as we were saying before, I mean, in the metaverse is a community. It's a new community. We are trying uh, to sell also into this community. Maybe one day we will also cross, uh, uh, we will like roll all the NFT into all our company. We are considering this because I think uh, there is uh, lots of positive uh, uh, things about it. Uh, we are also considering of selling experiences, so not only a room night, but also what we are selling offline with our concierge team, uh, specific or private uh, villa tours of Lake Como, so something very unique. So we are developing uh, all this uh, new world. As we were saying, it's quite complex, uh, but we, we are trying. <laughs> and where can people go to, to find the, the, the NFT itself? Where can people go to see it and buy it if they want to? On the OpenSea platform. Mm -hmm. I will share the link so you can direct, directly link it and open it directly. There will be all the information, how you can buy it, how you can use it, when, uh, everything. Brilliant. So I will share the link, definitely. Yeah, please do. If you pop that in the chat. Yes. Um, and, then, and then we can um, allow it, our audience to, to follow up on that. So that brings our conversation to a close today. I'm sure we could have chatted for much longer, given <laughs> the complexities and, and topics that we have touched on today. So as I mentioned earlier today, we've got all the LinkedIn profiles of our speakers into the chat. So please do connect. Please do follow up with all your questions, because I still have many <laughs> that I'll be asking these guys later. So if my colleagues could uh, please bring up the slides and I'll just have a, a few closing lines to run you through today. I would like to flag uh, the next webinar in the Trailblazer series. It's called the synergies between hotels and retail, which in a way is kind of linked to our conversation today. We've seen how retail has really innovated their payment strategy with the likes of Klarna, um, which we will be talking about. So on Monday, the 11th of April, um, I will be back. Uh, the link to register for that webinar um, has been popped into the chat or if you prefer, you can use the QR code at the bottom left hand side of your screen. And at the end of this month, you will find us in Paris on the 28th and 29th of March for our latest hospitality and real estate event called Recharge. Now, courtesy of Disneyland 
Paris. <laughs> the event is going to end at Val de Europe, which is a business and living hub. And here we're going to get a sneak peek at the future projects and a VIP show around. So it will be absolutely fantastic to see you all there in person. You can buy your tickets now. The link has been popped into the chat. Um, and if you would like further info, about Recharge or about any of the webinars in this series, please do get in touch with my colleague, Katie. Her details are in the chat and they are also up on your screen now. And all that's left for me to say is thank you. Thank you to Bizzle and Eleanor for sponsoring. Thank you to our speakers today for their insights. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. Um, we have a two minute countdown clock, so that is going to allow our audience time to follow up on any of the links that have been popped into the chat today. I think I saw your, yes, Ludovica has now popped in uh, the Open Seas okay. link there too. So um, please do take your time following up, but otherwise, that's all from us. Take care, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and we'll be back in April. Thank you very much.